Hi, um, I'm Michael Preston. I am the executive director of CSNYC. This is our um, final meetup of the school year. Hard to believe that it's already <coughs> June tomorrow. Um, Everyone is so sad. I know. <laughs> Kids are counting down the seconds to the end. Um, but we are, it's fun. It's always nice to end the year on a high note. And we have um, what feels like a star-studded panel here tonight in a topic that everybody wants to talk about. Um, and so that is a, uh, feels good. And um, I think that it's nice sometimes to take a step back from all the uh, the daily efforts we put into the, our work to think about how we all got here. And um, it's obviously been a pretty incredible couple of years for computer science in K-12. Um, CSNYC is four years old this month. And um, uh, we didn't have a birthday party. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, um, it's, it's nice to look back and see how much is, has happened since then, how much we, we helped happen and how much all of you helped happen in this national movement that we're all a part of. Um, and it's also nice to reflect on how K-12 CS, even though it feels like a new thing, actually builds on a lot of history and a lot of history that was um, built by women, um, from people like uh, Jen Cuny at NSF, Jane Margolis, others who have written about, created curriculum, um, done research, created the opportunities for other people to do their work. And so uh, tonight what we're going to do is focus on um, these esteemed panelists who I'll let Leanne introduce in just a second and talk about where we are now and where we need to go um, in the future so that we're serving more girls and getting more women into the pipeline. Um, so without further ado, thanks for being here. Um, and here's my colleague, Leanne Delizer. Hi, everybody. I'm Leanne. I'm the Director of Education and Research at CSNYC, and I like to describe my job as I get to consult with people to help them do quality computer science education and then do research to make sure that what I'm telling them is right. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with pretty much every organization that's here on the stage with me on the panel tonight. And we thought tonight would be a great chance for us to get into the different flavors of getting girls into computing. Uh, I myself taught high school for 10 years before moving into the college scene and then beginning to do research and working with Michael at CSNYC. And the recruitment of young women has always been uh, a challenge and for me, something fun. So I taught, when I taught high school, I had a robotics club. And anyone who knows about high school computer science education, you know that the only place that there are less women than a computer science classroom is in your after school robotics club. Yes. <laughs> right? And so we had a 40 member robotics club in a 1,200 person high school. And we'd travel out to Ohio to go to these competitions with our 150 pound sumo robot and you know about 10 other robots we'd bring for other little mini things. And my club was about a third girls, and uh, we generally had more girls in the club than the rest of the entire arena combined, right? And so it became really interesting to think about the why I was able to recruit young women. And as I moved from the high school into research, thinking about not only the way that some of us do an excellent job on our own, just from our own intuition, but how can we take and communicate those things we do from our intuition into the larger community so that folks who are better at other things can also learn from the things that we bring to the table. So I think that that's you know, a really important piece of my story. Uh, and I'll mostly be moderating tonight, so that's the story you'll hear from me tonight. Uh, I'm lucky to be joined by these four women who represent four amazing organizations and really different perspectives on the work for getting girls engaged in computing. So I'm going to start all the way over on the far, far end with Diane. Uh, Diane Levitt is from Cornell Tech, and I'll let her uh, introduce herself to the room. Thanks, Leanne. I'm Diane Levitt. I'm the Senior Director of K-12 Education for Cornell Tech. For those of you who don't know, uh, Cornell University won a competition from the Bloomberg administration, well, I'm going to guess it was five years ago now. Uh, we are building a campus on Roosevelt Island. A lot of times when I say Roosevelt Island, people are like, oh, I heard about this. And yes, we are moving there July 17th, so it's actually really happening. 
uh, which is very exciting to us. Um, and uh, really from the beginning, um, my dean, Dan Huttenlocker, felt that the K-12 space was core to the mission of our campus, that we, not only uh, because we are uh, charged with helping to build out the New York City ecosystem, which will not, tech ecosystem will not grow, you know, only on people who move to New York. Um, and uh, not only because we are in business with the city of New York, um, but because we consider this a social justice mission, which is very much aligned with the uh, university. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about uh, Whitney. I'm wearing this shirt, which is a nice happy accident since I'm actually filling in for the executive director of Whitney who's flat on her back uh, with a uh, backache. Um, Whitney is uh, Women in Tech and Entrepreneurship in New York, and our goal is uh, to partner with CUNY to drive more women into the major and minor and related disciplines at CUNY and then into the tech workforce. So I own like the first 5% of that pipeline, but I'm, I'm a huge fan. Or for most of the people in this room, the last 5% of our pipeline. Yes. yes right? Well, I actually, you know, our, our K-12 work is really uh, mostly focused on middle yeah. school. But yes. Yeah. Chrissy, so Chrissy is from Girls Who Code. <laughs> awesome. So I'm Chrissy Zicarelli, and I work at Girls Who Code. Uh, it's a nonprofit that aims to close the gender gap in technology. We have two primary programs that we use to do this. One is our summer immersion program, which is getting started next week for summer 2017. So it's a seven week immersive program full time for girls uh, going into 11th and 12th grade. And it's hosted at tech companies. So we aim to not only teach them the computer science content that they'll need to be successful on the rest of their tech journey, but also to give them an idea of what it's like to work in a tech office. We arrange field trips and speakers so that they get sort of the complete picture <laughs> of what opportunities are available to them should they choose to major, minor, and pursue a career in computer science. Uh, the other program that we have is a clubs program, which operates in middle and high schools all across the country. It runs during the school year, like a typical after school club. And the primary conceit of that program is that the girls spend a semester or the whole year learning computer science by building a project that they care about. So we've worked really hard in the last two years to build in authentic engineering practices of design and building, not just coding, so that they can bring all of that together again. And I primarily lead the instructor training and support team, so teachers are my people, and I'm the teacher person at Girls Who Code, so I'm very excited to be here. And, and you have this. two young women here in the front row who run the Girls Who Code Club at Stuyvesant. Wonderful! Oh. I'm so excited to talk to you once yeah. we get off these stools. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have Mutali. My name's Mutali Nkande. I am the K-12 person at Black Girls Who Code. So Black Girls Code is a national nonprofit that is specifically focused on getting girls who color girls of color into the tech workforce because we find that the inter we, we kind of sit at the intersection of race, class, and passion, and that's how we position ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have three main programs. We do code clubs, which are after school programs like our girls who code counterparts. Uh, and I actually launch them in New York. We start them in October. We do big marquee events. So we just had a hackathon at NYU Tandon School of Engineering, which went really well. We got written up in the HuffPo, and for anybody who knows, very smart brothers. So for our community, that's huge. And then we also do very bespoke one-off events, but we're really, really focused on pushing girls who girls of color, so that's Black, Hispanic, Pacific Islander, and Asian, into the workforce and providing them with communities that look like them, that feel like them, that are, and that are authentically safe. Great, and Andrea. So you guys are lucky. We are in the presence of a White House champion of change. That's right. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I am Andrea Chavez, and I am a teacher, just like you all. Uh, I started teaching Spanish um, nine years ago, and when I saw that the technology was changing, and I happened to be in uh, the Young Women's Leadership Network, and I'm teaching at Astoria, um, I saw that we are like we have all these girls 
that are minorities. We represent 66 different countries in just Astoria. I don't know how many more, uh, if we count the five other schools. Um, and then I saw the, ne the necessity of like bringing more technology in house. And I started just like basically doing it with them. So I don't have a background in CS. I don't have a background in technology. I did I did do a master's when I saw the necessity of uh, in, uh, integrating technology into the classroom, but didn't teach me any computer science. So I basically sat with my students and I started learning computer science with them. I provided the space and it happened that my principal was super supportive of it and she said how do you want to do this and at the moment without knowing the the gender gap we know i knew the gender gap in girls but i didn't know the gender gap in latinas in tech which mm -hmm. is even like less i think yeah. it's like one percent latinas represented in the tech community i said you know what it's easier for me to do it with our native speakers because we have uh, Spanish native speakers, 40% uh, of them in Tools of Astoria. So I said, I'm just give me the, the, the native speakers. I will conduct the whole class in Spanish, but we will learn two languages that, la, at the same time. At that moment, we were making video games uh, using a language that is called C++. And uh, today, we actually were at Facebook and someone asked one of the kids, how, like what languages do you know? And she was like Python, JavaScript, Java, C++, HTML. Oh, I think I know. I have write code. Like at least I have write hello world in a lot of languages. And that is that's basically who we are. We are a network of five different schools. All the schools are public, but are for girls. And yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great, six through 12. Yes, six through 12, yes, yeah. thank you. Great, so I was on a panel last week um, that kind of did things a little interesting, and I think I might try and do the same thing here today. Uh, before I do the couple of prepared questions that these guys got to see beforehand, um, I'd love to see, I'd love to ask the audience, what questions do you have for the panel just hearing their introductions? What would you like to know about? And I'm just, we're not going to answer them as, we ask, as you ask them. I'm literally just going to field a whole lot of questions and then see if we can weave them all together into the next half hour of conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, just, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm here to listen and, and learn. And um, I'm a student at NYU for Games for Learning, so it's kind of a, my field. But uh, I, I'm just wondering. There's, there's a lot of importance about girls in tech, for sure. What about making it equal? Like, uh, bringing boys and girls together, not kind of isolating the girls for girls and, and, and stuff like that. I'm just wondering if there's like, any, any balance as well. Just... Yeah. Um, Great. Well, no, we're not no. going to answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hard part. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I forget your name. I'm sorry. Chrissy. Chrissy. Yes. You, you mentioned that you expose girls to an actual work environment. Do you prepare them at all about sexism, you know, which we still read in the New York Times is prevalent in the technology world? Do you say anything about it to them or give them any coping skills or how to deal with it? So not only inclusive environments, but how they deal with it once they get to the inclusive environments. Yeah. Absolutely. I just want to say it's a blessing to sit here and not have to answer. I know. Because <laughs> we have to think about the questions, I'm, right? I'm loving this. Um, I, I was actually um, curious about uh, the different type of programs that focus on the younger kids versus the older kids. Like how you, what you do with them as, as they're younger and kind of how you try to kind of get them. Great, so like the pipeline from yeah. early to older. Great. Yes? Uh, I'd like to uh, some, at some point hear about the success stories of girls who have uh, come through your programs uh, and graduated and what they've gone on to do. Wonderful. Uh, 
Sorry? I guess more about like advice you can give to clubs or like actually like young people like I mean like teenagers in school like us about like how we can improve our club and yeah make it more open to the girls in our community. Great. To add on to that, how are kids girls interested mm. in the tech field when it's so there's such a such a daunting task and it's such a it's such a disparity between you know, boys and girls. But more so, how basically it's just keep them going in and forcing because I'm sorry, I teach with girls in. Um, I teach data analytics, mm -hmm. another component. Of, oh, a woman after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> data and data. just trying to get these girls. I have high school students in East Harlem, and trying to get the girls are interested, but trying to keep them interested long enough to go into college and to go into CUNY and say. That's a major I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? Yeah, it's wonderful. And I'd be curious to find out what, if anything, the can do to integrate computer science into the larger world of, you know, um, instead of just keeping computer science in a silo, you know, how does it relate to other fields? Yeah, sure. I was thinking um, if you could talk about opportunities for undergraduates to come and volunteer. Um, and so I had a few of my girls come to go to the Black Girls Code Hackathon, um, and they volunteered as like group leaders. Hearing more about those opportunities would be good. Great. I'm just wondering how each of your organizations follows up with girls just to see what they digested and actually just continue the relationship. I was interested in what each of your organizations has faced in terms of challenges with scaling mm -hmm. and whether like how big a priority that is and whether and tying in with a kind of pipelines question whether you think of different kind of categories of, of um, production sorry <laughs> uh, whether like some some uh, students might just want to be exposed <coughs> whereas, whereas some you know you want to put all the way into the street. You don't want to see something. Great. So I think I've heard a really great strand of, you know, we often talk about young women, we talk about the recruitment, the engagement and retention, and then helping them find the next journey on their path, right? And I think that all of your questions fit within that story. And so I'd like to kind of start, I didn't really hear a lot of recruitment questions. So I'm going to kind of leap over that a little bit and get to the engagement question. What do you do? What are your best recommendations or resources for engaging young women while they're in your programs, in your classes, and working with you? Okay. You want me to start? So Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I invent a lot of things, and I create <laughs> a lot of things just to like make sure that they could see the different possibilities. So for example, one of them is the digital dance that we do. So we blend dance and technology. So <clears throat> this, this didn't come out of like, oh yes, let's do this. No, it was out of an observation, which are the girls that are not, that are maybe, I don't wanna say afraid, but that, that are not exposed to technology in tools. And because we have so many different cultures represented, they love to represent their culture through dance. So I identified that, and then I was looking how many of these girls that are dancing are in technology, and it was very minimal, because the ones that were doing the technology, some of them are dancing, but not all of them. So then I was like, this is the perfect combination. Let's do some dance, and let's bring some technology in here and see what is possible. So when I started this, and I started it two years ago, I had not a clue what I was going to do. I just simply said to one of my coworkers, Emily Fields, I said, because she's a dancer, <clears throat> I said, do you mind coming with me into this project that is a little crazy? And she said, all right, let's do it. Uh, and then my second question is for my tech girls. And I was like, do you want to do this? Do we want to collaborate? You guys are 25. Each of you will get a you you will get a mentee and you will get a girl to either code, graphic design, or filmmake. 
to like make this dance and that's kind of like so it's kind of like looking for the different pipe, like pipelines that are there to get the girls um so knowing that i do also a summer program to prepare them kind of like for girls code like we push them a lot to go to to girls code we um it's, it's smaller than them but we also go to the two different companies we also like in my spanish class they do video games for apps and then in my tech group class they collaborate with each other in the different technologies um i don't want to keep talking because <laughs> yeah. I, like, I keep talking forever so. I, I think we're very similar with black girls co because we're a very popular culture driven brand mm -hmm. so we look to where our girls are our biggest success to date was a partnership that we had with 20th century fox around the movie hidden figures mm -hmm. so we were able to access katherine johnson taraji p henson the girls that are really our ambassadors got to interview the cast they got to hang out with janelle monet janelle coded with them and then they were able to go back and tell that story and because of our partnership with Google and our partnership with YouTube, we could then push that out. But we sent our girls a code, so they got to see all of this first. So in every market, that happened in LA, then we did it again in New York. And in every market that we're represented, we were lucky enough that 20th Century Fox were able to travel with us. We're doing something with Musical.ly this coming weekend because we found out, kind of like you, our girls really like lip sync battle. So we were... We're creating computational music, and then they'll, cre they'll create the music, and then we're going to have a lip sync battle. But it's really through strategic relationships. And I, I don't know if anybody's read the book Love Languages. Kind of kooky, not, our, not this crowd. OK, good, oh, yeah. good. <laughs> OK, so for love language readers, um, which is just a book about how you express joy, right, through love. Mm -hmm. We found that one of Black Girls Code's love languages was fun. So to your question about how do you keep engaging them we try and find where their passion lives and then we sneak in math and we sneak in technology and before they know it they're just so happy that they're doing it and we've had really tremendous success with that model but i don't want to leap forward to your question the question is then how do you scale fun right mm -hmm. and what's fun to one person isn't fun to, to another. another person uh -huh. yeah I, I would echo what both of them said we really do try to make it technology and all the projects in our curriculum open-ended enough that the girls can build in their interests. But I think especially since we serve mostly sixth through 12th graders, that's when their interests and after school activities are defined by what their friends do. So that's also been kind of a challenge with, we have a lot of folks that, you know, they start their club off really strong at the beginning of the year, but then the junior play happens and auditions are in November and then everyone stops coming. So it kind of gets to the question of scale too, even if they love it and their friends are there, like how do you get build something that can last for an entire year, but is also flexible enough that girls can go explore other interests and understand that computer science throughout their life will be compatible with wanting to run track or even being a math lead or any of those other external interests they have and they don't have to give up everything just to do computer science. So Whitney, um, you know, we, because we're lodged pretty firmly in higher ed, uh, we have uh, access, easy access to scale. If you want scale, go to CUNY, <laughs> right? Uh, 240,000 undergraduates, it's the largest public institution in the United States, um, and as diverse as an institution can be uh, only in America. So um, that's really the reason that Cornell Tech has partnered with CUNY, is to figure out if we can really drive uh, the numbers. So we have kind of a progression, right, and we start uh, engaging young women uh, really in high school. At, uh, so this year, for instance, we held, we called it a build-a-thon. We have a sort of an anti-hack mentality at our, on our campus. So uh, we called it a build-a-thon. We brought high school students, uh, college students, grad students, and early career women together to build skills for Alexa that connect uh, older adults to family and community. So we had a, uh, 100 uh, young women uh, participate in this. We brought in later career mentors for each group. Uh, we gave them some skills building. They were 
uh, from all over the map in terms of both geographic location and their skills. Some of them had never touched code, and some of them were really proficient uh, programmers. And it was truly an amazing day. We had a competition at the end. We had judges from the university. It was incredible. So we start in high school just sort of wetting the appetite and saying, this thing that you might be curious about is real, and it does real things. I don't really fall into the um, belief that young women only want to do work that changes the world. I think young women also would like to make a living. Mm -hmm. Just going to put it out there. Uh, you know, we're constantly like, oh, let's do social good. And I'm, I'm a, I personally am driven that way, but I have really come to understand that people come to work for all sorts of reasons. And uh, in New York, uh, for the women we work with, a lot of them would like to get out of poverty, and I'm all over that idea. Mm -hmm. So um, what comes next is this incredible program that we're about to start also in a couple of weeks that we call Summer Guild. So Summer Guild is two weeks for rising CUNY freshman girls. Fresh women is not a word. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, so once they're accepted to CUNY, they get accepted to Summer Guild. They do not have to have any computer science background whatsoever. They have to be curious. That's it. They answer three questions. Mostly I'm looking to see, did you write complete sentences in your application? It's about a five minute Google form. Uh, and so we're going to serve 200 young women this summer in four sessions, two weeks, they have a challenge. Last year when we did this, the challenge was from Verizon. How might we make the Verizon store experience more delightful? Some would say uh, that was not hard. But actually, our young women <laughs> created incredible digital environments for uh, those um, customers. And they did it by having many days of design thinking uh, learning. Uh, being out practicing talking to strangers and then interviewing people. They come back into the classroom, they prototype, and then the following week, so that's week one. Week two, because we don't want to rely on their very nascent uh, coding skills, we don't want their vision constrained by their ability, we bring in professional developers to partner with those teams. So each team has two developers, and together for two days, those young women project manage. They get their hands dirty with real live code, um, and they watch their idea kind of come to life. Then we teach them how to present very quickly, and they present to uh, all sorts of folks from our campus. So for instance, uh, the first two sessions of Summer Guild this year, the challenge comes from uh, the city, Department of Capital Planning who have all this data up on communities and want to know, how can we get this data into the hands of communities so that we might better serve and know their needs? So uh, our young women are going to three neighborhoods this year, Jerome Avenue in the Bronx, Two Bridges in Chinatown, and uh, Gowanus in Brooklyn. Uh, the city has set up these meetings. All I mean to say is, we're giving students a real life experience of what code can do. Hopefully they get into, they go to CUNY, they decide <coughs> to major or minor in tech or a related discipline. There we have uh, internships for them. We have innovative curriculum for them at CUNY where 12 or 15 colleges are uh, testing that out. We have community, which I think is actually the answer for how we keep them in. We keep them in by building a community around them that supports them when things get challenging, not only when the work gets challenging, but when you feel like you don't belong. The optics, when you're in a room full of 20 or 30 or 40, 50 undergraduates who look like you and do what you do, that kind of changes the picture, right? Um, and then uh, conversations with practitioners. That's how we keep them engaged. So something I heard from all four of you that kind of transitions us into some other themes we heard from the questions is 
lots of people share their challenges <coughs> through the questions, right? How do you keep them engaged? How do you integrate content? How do you support them as they go back to the communities that don't all look like them, where you're not a room of 40 people who look like you? And the thing I heard that was common across all of you was partnerships, yes. right? Working outside of yourself. So I'm curious in the room, how many of you are classroom teachers? How many of you are students? How many of you work for an org or a nonprofit or support teachers in some way? So we've got a nice mix of people here. Um, and I think, you know, looking at who raised their hand for being a teacher, a lot of those questions were, how do I help young women? And I know that teaching computer science can feel like an island, right? So what advice can you give in terms of thinking about how to, how to reach out, like who your partners are? Because at some point, you had no partners. And then you said, this would be a good partner. And I reached out. And I'm going to kind of shrink this down to just the first two of you. Because you work with some pretty amazing, big, national focus things. Mm -hmm. And Andrea, all of your partnerships were with your girls and other teachers in your school. So I'd love to hear those two perspectives on it to start. Yeah. Diane wants to jump in, too. But. <laughs> I'm just saying that we are also. Yes, and, yeah. yes, and others. Yeah, uh, just to like, kind of like go back. Like, also, like one thing that I see in all of us in common, and I, I do happen to work with these three organizations, um, is flexibility and creativity, and just like let the girls imagine what is possible. So when we, when we are giving the girls these, like, oh, you just do whatever you want, with this, but you have to get there at, with code, basically. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of like what it brings me up to the partnerships, is like those are the kind of partners that I want. Because I need, like one of you were saying, I need the different, the different uh, ways, because not everybody likes or gets attention in just one way. So I need all of these partnerships around. So I do partner first with my students. Uh, so in my tech crew class, like I said before, I have project managers, um, graphic designers, uh, filmmakers, and coders. And they work, all of them together, to create different projects. And many times, you will be surprised how like the coders jump into the filmmaking, and the filmmaking is like, oh, but I need, need to understand the code in order to like, make this film. So they will like, just jump into each other's. And then from there, we connect to the different <laughs> partnerships. So for example, um, like for girls who code, like that was one of my first partners. Like we, I started an after the school program um, five years ago, four years ago with girls who code. Um, <clears throat> and someone was assigned to me from uh, BuzzFeed to like come and teach us code. At the moment, we were only 10 girls. Uh, and from there, uh, we saw that the, the necessity of like create our own summer like summer program to like get more girls. And now it is like so many opportunities. So like I work a lot with Cornell Tech. I work a lot with Girls Who Code, but I also work a lot with other companies to help us in many ways. Like it could be mentorship, or it could be let's go and visit, or we don't understand this piece of code. Who can help? And sometimes someone is like, okay, just come here, or we send someone there, or just Skype. So those are the type of partnerships that we look for, that someone that is flexible, creative, that we just like, like to help. Yeah. How, do you, how do you find your partners? Do you just like, how do you connect with them, right? It's, it's sometimes hard as a teacher to like, how do, I, how do I find this person who's going to come and help me? Yeah, plus it's like you are a teacher, you are not a networker, right? Like it's like, oh, it's another piece of my job. Um, I think just by talking to people, right? Like, like just by doing the work and then someone says, oh, she's doing this. Oh, let me just connect you with Diane. That's how I met Diane, like doing work, coming into the meetings. I, like we first met and I think in a Girls Who Code uh, meeting, uh, and that is started like kind of like our connections. You have helped me tremendously to like also connect to many people. Uh, from there, I connected to NCWIT, the National Coalition for Women in Technology. From there, people connected me to other people. 
uh, the, the work that the girls produce to connect you with many people. So the girls at the beginning, the, the first year that they produce video games, uh, I just tell them that they cannot just be there. They need to like do something with it. Like they need to tell the world that they have done this. So they apply for different things and that counts as part of the grade because sometimes they care about the grade, sometimes they don't, but just so they like take the extra step. And then that takes you somewhere else. That took me to the White House. They presented their video games. They have presented their video games for four years in a row uh, in the White House. And that got me to be a White House champion of change. And that, all those steps get you more people and more partnerships. So one thing at a time, right? Find <laughs> yes. a good partner and, and like all good networking advice, ask your partner who else you should be partnering with, yes. right? Exactly. I think that's a, it's a great piece of advice for teachers and it doesn't feel so overwhelming when it's like, oh, you have 30 partners, how do I get to 30? Yes. And I love that you start with the kids. Yes. Right, the kids are, are always our ultimate partners in the classroom. Yes. I think you kind of answered the question. Uh, we, we started with 12 girls in Oakland and we were 12 girls in Oakland and one of the mothers of the girls was a producer for Oprah Winfrey's Change Your Life Tour. So she said to our executive director, you should really go on this tour and we didn't have any money and it was 12 girls and she had a full-time job and she was you know she was like no I, I can't get time off work and she couldn't so she, when her boss said that she couldn't go and see Oprah she gave up her job and she went on the change your life tour and wow. Oprah ended up being our first partner Oprah said you should really meet my friend Michelle who was married to somebody called Barack that's how we got to, <laughs> that's how we got to the White House and then our executive director also became a champion of change and once you're once you're elevated at that level and I, I feel like that was such a good time for science nationally and such a good time for computer science it just led to Google reaching out. Suddenly we were on these radars that we never would have been. And one of the things that I always say is that Black Girls Code are going to bring you the cute. If you want a picture, we, we have it and it's a gorgeous <laughs> one. And people were really attracted to not just the visual of the girls creating, but the excitement of what was happening and to your students that came. We had, for the first time in our history at that hackathon, one-to-one -one mentorship for our girls. So we had 100 girls show up and 150 mentors. And the thing that we loved was they would say things to us like, a white man is helping me, he's mentoring me. And, we would, and that's a point of that was the point of teaching. Right-minded people are right-minded. And we've got to learn to have the confidence to have these relationships that are going to build the whole. Or um, we serve Hispanic girls as well, so we had for the first time ever Spanish speaking mentors for people that could learn in Spanish better than they could learn in English. And it's just kind of gone on. And then one of the things that I would say in our environment, our executive director speaks a lot. She did a TED talk. So suddenly when you're on the TED stage, that kind of pushes you out further. But the work, I'm a former classroom teacher. So my passion and the reason I came into the organization was <coughs> classroom teachers are teaching class. They're not out finding Oprah. So the way that we, the, our strategy for getting to the classroom population was through the superintendents. And our thought was if we can get the superintendent to come to our office for 40 minutes and we spend 20 of those in the Google, in, in the Google um, cafe, we've got the district. And I was right. So we're currently going to be moving into six districts. And we're touching, the educators that we've touched are responsible for 250,000 students, principally in the K through 6 to, through 12 population. But there was a question about how do we get from pre-K, so we're doing some experiments around pre-K pre through 2 and doing some work with that population as well. And I feel that now that we are actually in the schools, all the Oprah and the Taraji and the glitter and the Barack and everything is kind of starting to make a little bit more sense, yeah. I think. Yeah, us. and I think it's super powerful to invite an administrator. Like, they come into your class to observe you, right? They, yeah. they walk in and, and you're like, okay, it's my observation. <laughs> I'm going to be standing up straighter a little bit today and then hope that the kids raise their hands a little taller. Um, but I think that that invitation is super important and a way to engage 
not only the people in our building, right, the other teachers, but also potential partners. Come and see what I'm doing and maybe we can work together. So I know Chrissy and Diane are both chomping at the bit to answer this question, but I'm gonna give them a different one. Um, so we've talked a lot about girls in the program and in the classroom. And the thing about both of your programs is that you represent a longitudinal pathway for them, right? The clubs, the summer immersion programs, Whitney as a transition from K-12 to college. Um, and we had questions about pathways for, for young women. So can you tell us a little bit about the pathways and maybe tell a story of a young woman who went through multiple sections or, or advanced their own pathway through engagement with your org or the program? Sure. Um, I can start. So we have kind of a very nice built-in pathway since our clubs start in sixth grade and the summer program is for rising 11th and 12th graders. So for the last two years, over 35% of our summer students have come from clubs, which is really exciting for us that we have sort of that sustained engagement. Um, I'm trying to think of one specific person that has gone through all of them and then is now majoring in computer science, but I think that the beauty of a lot of our work in our alumni cohort is that that is not an atypical story. Um, that someone sort of gets that interest sparked after school, they spend the summer exploring that a little bit more. Uh, as I work with most of our instructors, all of our summer classrooms also have uh, two teaching assistants. And so about 40% of those teaching assistant positions also go to girls that were in one of our programs, either during the school year or during the summer. So we stay pretty in touch and try and provide a lot of opportunities within our organization to sort of shift around, try different experiences, different ways to interact with computer science, including teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I have a specific story from Girls Who Code. Do you want to, you can share from ahead. Girls Who Code, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a, a student, um, her name is Margot. I have many stories, but I'll tell <laughs> this one. Margot Richard, uh, she was super quiet. She was like on the side, uh, but then she saw that everybody was kind of like coding in my Spanish class, so she like made her video game. Her video game got her to like present in the White House. Then she's like, okay, let me go to the summer program, Girls Who Code, but she didn't really want to go. She was just doing it because the other girls wanted, like they were doing it, and I was kind of like pushing everybody just to like apply. So she got accepted. Uh, she did the summer program, she loved it. Uh, and then from there, actually no, actually she went to the White House after Girls Who Code before the game that she created in Girls Who Code. Uh, and then after that, she one time came and said, I am gonna apply to this scholarship that Girls Who Code sent me, but I'm just, and, and I was like, okay, fine, let's apply. Uh, and I remember we sat like for two days to the scholarship I had to, like, like, uh, like, I don't know how many pages of questions for me, the mentor, and then hers. So we were looking at each other's answers and like she was revising mine and I was revising hers. Then we sent it and then somehow the counselor, she was like, oh my God, she, Margot just got in the second round of uh, Bill Gates scholarships. Did you know that? And I was like, oh, that was what we were applying for. <laughs> <laughs> And then she was like, "Yes, could you like this is huge." And I was like, "Really? I like I didn't even know how huge it was. I don't even think that Marco knew how huge it was. It was like we were just doing it." And then uh, she got it. She got it. And this is like the last round of uh, Bill Gates' wow. scholarships. Mm -hmm. And when she went to her first meeting, they told her, "Do you know that this is the chance to get this scholarship is 001 percent?" Uh, to get it, but Margot like was super active after Girls Who Code. She actually is in the Girls Who Code uh, videos. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so she was the one out of the three girls that were selected. She was one of the selected girls to like get to the videos. So she after that she became like, and I am gonna do the club, and I am going to like like do with like do it with these kids, and like that's what got her that scholarship. Awesome. And I thought of an example too as you were as you were talking about Margo, uh, someone who had started in a summer immersion program in Miami and then worked as a TA for two consecutive summers, just started uh, her CS degree at George Washington University in DC. 
and she walked in first day of lecture, you know, it's a huge hall, it's a, like a new, totally different group of people that don't look like who she grew up with in Miami, but she spotted someone that she had met on a field trip that we did last summer with every single program in New York and was able to sit down next to them and they found two other Girls Who Code alums in the same class. So now they have their own sisterhood study group and they keep in they keep in so touch with us. So that's like kind of the exact case study of what we want to happen when they launch sort of out of our program and then into the the undergraduate space. That's amazing. What I hear, you know, from all of us really is that there's <laughs> there's two pieces here and one is opportunity that I think what happens is that young women engage with these programs and through them we expose them to opportunity. So, uh, for instance, you know, through Whitney, we have uh, I don't know, we do 40 or 50 internships a summer for Whitney students. There are scholarships, but we've had uh, two or three young women that I can think of where the internship that they got through Whitney, this opportunity, they might not even have thought about a tech internship, has really changed their lives. We had one student who actually interned for a faculty member uh, at, um, at Cornell Tech, a woman named uh, Dr. Deborah Estrin, who I will tell you, if you happen to have the playing card deck of notable women in tech, I don't know if you do, <laughs> She's the king of diamonds. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, and you know, when we told her she'd gotten this academic internship, she was like, I don't know, you know, I'm not that good at, our, our, our students do a lot of that uh, sort of expectations management. We kind of pushed her into it. Well, not only did she work for Deborah over the summer, Deborah kept her for the full year. She's on a, she is a, an, and now doing research. She's going to be on a paper that's published, that's a very big deal. Um, we have a student who, who, whose um, immigration status was a little unclear when she was awarded an internship. I want to say at AOL, but I might have that wrong. And, and they had promised her the internship, but then she couldn't uh, take it right away because she couldn't get her paperwork in order. Well, she got her paperwork in order, and then the summer was almost over. And she went to them, and she was like, no. You told me I could have an internship. And so, uh, you know, they really responded to that grit. They gave her a school year internship. She is turning that into a job. So we see that a lot. So I think that opportunity piece is gigantic for young women, um, particularly young women from economically vulnerable communities and young women of color. And the other piece that I hear is the community piece which is, you know, you stand with us and we will stand with you. And, uh, and I really believe that that is, you know, kind of the boat in the pipeline that's going <clears> to <throat> keep our young women moving forward because they care about community. It's the same mm -hmm. piece that gets them into the school play, mm -hmm. yeah. right, is that piece that, uh, you know, I stand with my sisters. So I think underneath it all, too, and I hear a third level to everything, the two things you said, absolutely, and then woven through it is this amazing time when someone came into their lives and encouraged them. That's right. And we know that lots of research, I get to bring in some research here, lots of research says that the most important thing for a young woman to engage, to persist, to continue through is encouragement, right? We all suffer a little bit of imposter syndrome, we all suffer a little bit of believing that this space is not for me. And community and having those friends is one way to see ourselves in that space, but it's, it's all about encouragement, whether it comes internally or from a great teacher, right? From someone who's helping to build a program that says, no, you can go and do this thing. And so don't underestimate. I think the, the stories from, I used to belong, I still belong to the advanced placement uh, computer science listserv. It's a group of teachers who teach computer science around the country. And there was always conversations about how do we get young girls into our classroom? And people every year, always the first response to that was, you make up invitations and you hand it to them. Right. And it says, you are invited to take computer science. And you give it to every single girl who has the prerequisite for computer science. Like it's not that you pick the top best 10 or whatever. You give it to everybody. And at some point during the school year, if you want to keep them, if you want them to persist, 
you give them a little note that says, you did an amazing job today. That recognition is so important. The, the, your student who was in the Girls Who Code video and who was recognized for her work, I'm sure she shines yeah. because of that. And that, that shine is really important as well. I think, though, there's a really important point that you make here, and I know it's not my turn to speak. That's okay. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I heard Andrea make it as well, which is part of the way we get women into these classrooms is that we don't uh, define who belongs there, right. right? We don't say, well, you're a math kid, so you should take CS, right? And that, those um, pathways have no meaning for computer science. They really don't. And you know, the fact that you got your dancers mm -hmm. involved is you don't know where that's going to go. And honestly, you don't have to know. Yeah. Um, we are certainly tracking what's happening to students at CUNY. We need to see that we're being successful. We think we know what we're doing, but we won't know what we're doing until we see what we did, right? And we're, we're definitely collecting those data, and I think that's really critical. But what we shouldn't do is decide ahead of time who belongs in those classrooms. But I would just say to that, and I don't want to throw you off course, one of the things for Black Girls Code has, that's been very powerful is storytelling and Agreed. telling real stories. So going, Hidden Figures was such a pivotal moment in the, in the history of our organization because it got our girls wondering, well, how many other stories do I not know that are like this? Or, and how can I become part of that story? Mm -hmm. And we work with some researchers up at Teachers that are looking at the link between narratives and then building growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And then building um, identities around academic excellence because another layer that we see, at least in our work, that race and poverty impacts this idea of who you should be. And how do we, how do we create another identity within you know, that socio-economic ec space. So I would say the invitations are good, but telling the story of one of your students or we have similar students that have gone on and done great things has really helped us. And Instagram, like we're a big social media organization, Instagram showing people pictures of what we do always makes people want to come and do it with us. Andrea mentioned the National Center for Women in Information Technology. They have a large amount of resources on their website, ncwit.org. Um, I highly recommend engaging with them. Uh, I helped start the Academy for Software Engineering here in New York, and we have, uh, there's a large gender disparity in the school. And after the first year, we really worked with NCWIT to try and refine our materials, and we changed our recruitment materials from what you can make with technology to who was in the school and telling the story even of the students, the near peers, maybe they're not super exceptional people yet, they're on their pathway to get there, but to let young girls who were thinking about the school see, oh, there's, there's girls there who are having success and who are on the brochure for the school, that's really super engaging and super exciting for them. So I do need to wrap us up and I'm gonna, I know Diane, I'm gonna, <laughs> in, so, we're going to go out with one really, really quick answer from all of you because we are videotaping this and we do put all of our meetups on the web. So for all the people here, I hope you stay, have more food and drink, and get a chance to talk to these folks about how to engage with them or partner with them. For someone who might be watching this video later, what's a good way for them to get in touch with you to reach out either about your story or to talk to you about partnerships in your programs? Okay. So uh, I would say first, uh, go to YouTube and um, do um, research, I mean, uh, just find the Digital Dance 2.0, you could see that, that's very inspirational. But also find Tecnologicas, I am a Tecnologica. Uh, this year we were like um, 10 women that are represented in technology, Latinas in technology uh, were chosen. I am one of them, I'm super proud because I was right next to NASA women and Google women. Um, so it's pretty nice to be there. Uh, and my email, um, andrea at twills-astoria.org. And you could also find me in social media. I'm always in uh, Twitter and Instagram, uh, just telling the story, to right. sharing the story. Thank yeah. you. And you can find Black Girls Code on Twitter, at Black Girls Code. Tweet us, us and we will tweet right back.
Great. Cool. Girls Who Code is everywhere. Um, I would say all the social everything. Uh, projects.girlswhocode.com is a gallery that we have set up for our students to submit their projects at the end of their program experience. If you want to get in touch with me directly, my email is chrissy, just my first name, at girlswhocode.com. Uh, so to find out more about Whitney, there's a Whitney website, uh, a Whitney page on the CUNY website, W-I-T-N-Y, just search it. Also on the Cornell Tech under the impact page, where you can also learn about our K-12 work, uh, is the Whitney website. I'm, if you Google my name, Diane Levitt, my Cornell bio and my email address comes up. So, uh, so find me. Great, sure. we'll have the right spelling of everybody's name on the CSNYC meetup page so folks can find it. Thank you guys all for coming out. I hope you stay and we continue this great conversation. And thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah.